In the race for the presidency in 1800, only two men end up with a chance of winning, and they are both from the Republican Party. One is Hamilton's hated enemy, Thomas Jefferson himself. The other is a genial, politically savvy New York lawyer. His name is Aaron Burr. The rule of my life is to make business a pleasure and pleasure my business. Aaron Burr was born into an American aristocracy. His father was president of Princeton University and a pillar of New England society. Hamilton and Burr know each other very well. They are both involved in national politics, but hold very different views about the role of a political leader. While Hamilton considers public service a sacred trust, Aaron Burr has other motives for trying to get elected. Compared to the drudgery of the law, the life of a politician is honorable, fun, and very profitable. Burr has become a contender for the presidency. Hamilton now has to make an agonizing decision. Jefferson or Burr? If there be a man in the world I ought to hate, it is Jefferson. But Burr has absolutely no morals, private or public. He listens to nothing but his own ambition. He ends up in this moment in 1800 where what are his options? Well, it's either Burr or Jefferson for president. I mean, it's like the ultimate Hamiltonian nightmare. He sees both men not as statesmen, but as contemptible politicians, pandering to the populace by telling voters what they want to hear. Hamilton must now choose the lesser of two evils. Jefferson has a tincture of fanaticism, it's true. He is much too earnest in his democracy, crafty, not too scrupulous in politics, and he's not very mindful of the truth. In short, he's a contemptible hypocrite, but, but he's as likely as any man I know to compromise. Even though he disagreed totally with Jefferson, Jefferson at least was interested in trying to do something that would be good for the United States. Burr, Burr was in it for Burr. Here's a telling incident. When I headed the Treasury, he criticized me for not using my power to alter the government for my own advantage. I told him I could never do such a thing in good conscience. Conscience, Burr replied. Great souls do not worry themselves with little details. Can you imagine such a man holding the power of the presidency? The vote among the electors is a tie and is sent to the House of Representatives, where again there is a tie. In a flurry of letters, Hamilton urges one congressman to switch his vote. The tie is broken. Thomas Jefferson becomes the third president of the United States. The Republicans are now firmly in control of the government. Populist politics, which Hamilton so hates, seems to be the order of the day. In his mind, the country which he has fought for most of his life is headed towards disaster. No army, no navy, no national defense, as little government as possible. Hamilton sees not just his life coming apart, but what is his future? In some ways, he really was a person who found his identity in making a contribution. He wasn't interested in great wealth. He really wanted to do something for the country that he came to, I mean, to give back to America. And after 1800, nobody wanted him to. Mine is an odd destiny. Perhaps no man in the United States has sacrificed or done more for the present Constitution than myself. And contrary to all my expectations, I still have to work to prop up its frail and worthless fabric. For my reward, I have a few murmurs from its friends and loud curses from its enemies. The best thing I can do is withdraw from the scene. Every day proves to me more and more 
that this American world is not made for me. Hamilton, um, he was a great statesman and a terrible politician. He could not make himself speak what he thought was untrue. He was too honest, too candid. People could provoke him by attacking his honor in such a way that he became extraordinarily uh, self-destructive. Um, Hamilton, in many ways, is a tragic figure because the love of honor, uh, which is the, the source of his greatness, I, I would argue, is completely consistent with Greek tragedy, also the source of his, his downfall. Hamilton may be out of political power, but he refuses to give up the fight. Now, age 46, he co-founds an opposition newspaper, the New York Evening Post, and he passionately defends Federalist editors in court when they are attacked by the Republican administration. He also has great hopes for the political career of his eldest son, Philip. Hamilton invested a lot of hope in this son, really thought that he saw a grand and glorious future for Philip. 